So on behalf of DO Kava, welcome to our 360 degrees of Kava series. Uh, thank you for taking the time out to be with us today uh, for this second session of the series focused on the production zones of Kava. Before I turn it over to the panel, uh, some housekeeping reminders for everyone that during the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants. We have the chat section and a Q&A section. Uh, so the chat section is sort of an informal way for you to communicate uh, with the other participants. Uh, so just be sure to select uh, everyone, all panelists and attendees in the two field as it can default to panelists only. And then the Q&A section. And this is where we'd like you to submit your questions to be answered during the webinar. The session will be recorded and the YouTube link to the recording will be shared with you uh, following the webinar. So we are very happy to welcome back our dynamic duo that will host today's session. Uh, Catherine Cole, uh, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon in the US and David Kermode uh, in London. And who will, they will be accompanied by a panel of individuals representing some fantastic Kava wineries. So I'll turn it over to them to introduce our panel. Hello, well, thank you for joining us. Hello from London. Um, as we're uh, a relatively unusual transatlantic double act uh, for the next hour, uh, we're going to introduce each other. Uh, based in Portland, Oregon, Catherine Cole is an experienced writer and broadcaster, uh, the author of five books on wine, most recently Sparkling Wine Anytime, as well as a host and executive producer of The Four Top, a food and drink podcast, and she also works in design and branding for the wine industry. Thanks for the introduction, David. I'm so happy to be able to introduce you, the one and only David Kermode, AKA Mr. Venosaurus. David is the drinks expert on Britain's most watched daytime TV show, This Morning on ITV. He's also the wine columnist at Club Enologique, as well as an international wine judge. So good to join you, David. Good to be here and uh, good to see you too, Catherine. Uh, so today's theme is 360 degrees of Carver and it's the Carver Zones of Production. And we're gonna hear from three Carver producers as well, which we're really looking forward to. Uh, we'll talk to uh, Marta Casas, sommelier and winemaker at Peres Balta. Uh, Marta shares her winemaking role with her sister-in-law, uh, Maria Elena. Uh, she has a master's degree in biodynamic agriculture, and she helped convert Paris Balta to achieve its Demeter certification for biodynamic practices. And next we will introduce Angel Hernandez, Export Director at Bodegas Faustino. Angel has an extensive career in exports, including dairy and olive oil brands. He has lived all over the world, including Ireland, England, Canada, and of course his homeland, Spain, where he currently resides. And our third guest, Mark Clapes, sommelier and export director at Giro Ribot, a family-owned winery in the heart of the Penedes area. Mark has worked for a diverse range of Cava wineries and earned his sommelier certification from the University of Barcelona. Uh, we'll also taste some wines uh, during the presentation. We appreciate that due to the huge interest in these webinars, not all of you viewing have all of the wines. Well, let's just dig into some education now. Is everyone ready? Um, as we learned in the last session, in 2020, Dio Cava announced a series of changes to help consumers trace the origin of cava. And so we're going to do a quick refresher right now. Um, we heard about the Cava de Guarda and Cava de Guarda Superior minimum bottle aging requirements of 9 and 18 months, respectively, and the Reserva, Gran Reserva, and Paraje Calificado tiers, which are aged between 18 and 36 months. But these quality classifications are not just tied to aging time. We're going to talk about place today, and I wanted to let you know about the new Elaborator Integral stamp that you'll be seeing on cavas that are 100% estate grown and made. So basically, these are grower cavas. And I have some exciting news for you that we shared in the last seminar. 
the entire Cava de Guarda Superior category will be coming from certified organic vineyards as of 2025. I am just so excited about that and I think we should all just celebrate that fact. This really drives home the message that these Cavas come from premium sites and the new Cava de Guarda Superior Paraje Calificado is a very rare reserve wine at the top tier of quality. This is sourced only from a short list of vineyard sites which have been declared in essence the equivalent of Cava's Grand Cru vineyards. Now each category will have color-coded labels to help consumers identify what type of cava they're getting. The other big news uh, a few months ago was the approval of the four regions and their respective subzones uh, to better help consumers understand the provenance of their choice of cava. Uh, the first thing to remember, uh, if you're not overly familiar with the, the region, uh, many people will know this already. Um, this is a really big DO and it's very unusual as it's not contiguous. Uh, there are four zones to the DO and they're actually some distance apart. Uh, take a look at the DO map and you'll be reminded why it's so unusual. Um, of these regions, it makes sense to begin with the Contact de Barcelona, why so? Well, uh, it's by far the biggest, accounting for more than 95% of production. Um, it's uh, concentrated as well. And uh, contact, by the way, translates uh, from Catalan as broadly as counties. So this is really a reference to the provinces around Barcelona, down to Tarragona, and, uh, and some distance uh, inland too. As we heard from uh, Catherine's fascinating history lesson last time, um, Carver has been produced here since 1872 around the town of San Sadumi de Noia, the Carver capital as it's known, though as we heard last time recognition of the name actually followed much later. Contact de Barcelona takes its name uh, from the former medieval territories, for those who know their history, under the auspices of the Count of Barcelona and it encompasses the lands to which that title was historically linked. Um, unsurprisingly, given its location, the climate is Mediterranean, but it's not as straightforward as just long summer sunshine and coastal cooling breezes, because as you head inland, there are mountain ranges, valleys, rivers, and the microclimates that go with such a varied terrain. So there's also a continental influence in terms of climate, as well as the conditions that you would expect to find at some altitude too. All of it, of course, optimum for grape growing. Now, this, uh, this region, Comtats de Barcelona, or the counties of Barcelona, as David explained, is divided into five different subzones based upon the geographical location, soils, and microclimatic conditions that differentiate them and make each one unique. So those are Vals de Noia Foix, Cerro del Mar, Conca del Gaia, Serra de Prades, and Pla de Ponent. So first, Val de Noia Foix uh, takes in the valleys of uh, two rivers, the Noia and the Foix. Uh, it's a temperate uh, Mediterranean climate protected from northerly winds by uh, the Montserrat Massif, uh, the mountains there. Altitude ranges uh, from 100 to 750 meters. Um, and in terms of varieties, you'll mainly find Charolo uh, closer to the coastline, uh, Macabao in the valleys, um, and uh, Paralada at altitude. And don't forget, a bit of a plug here, uh, the next of these sessions homes in on those uh, grape varieties. Uh, next, just north of Barcelona, the Serra de Mar has sandy and well-drained soils. Its Mediterranean climate is protected from cold winds by the Serra Lada de Marina, which is a high C-shaped ridge, C ridge with terrific hiking trails, I have to say. Uh, these are relatively low altitude vines at less than 100 meters or 330 feet of elevation. The specialties here are Panza Blanca, which is the local clone of Charello, as well as Chardonnay and Garnacha. Now, if you joined us for the last session, uh, I just want to remind you, this is the region that the Romans called Laetania, and as far back as 200 BC, they were transporting the wines from the Serra del Mar all over the empire. And sticking with that theme, uh, next, Conca del Gaia, first planted with vines uh, by those Romans. Uh, it's the basin of the river uh, Gaia, uh, a Mediterranean climate here with mild winters and hot summers tempered by uh, the sea breeze. It's a uh, narrow and thus uh, windy valley with uh, poor soils, um, altitude up to 400 meters and mostly Charolo, Macabo and Paralada. 
Well, let's move on to the Serra de Prades, north of the Prades Mountains, high above the city of Tarragona. This is in an area known as the Conca de Barbera. Fun fact, there are actually winery architecture tours in this area because uh, there's a famous architect named Cesar Martinel who designed and built some stunning wineries, so definitely worth a visit. At any rate, the soils here are calcareous with the Mediterranean climate, of course, and we also have the continental influence. There tends to be a wide diurnal swing in temperatures at this altitude. We're at 350 to 600 meters. That's 1,100 to 2,000 feet, so you get that wonderful brisk acidity in the fruit. Um, there's a specialty grape here called trepat. It's a lovely light grape that's indigenous to Catalonia. They also grow Macabeo and Parellada. And finally, uh, for this region, Pla de Ponent, uh, Terres de Ponent, uh, inland, a continental uh, Mediterranean climate with uh, diurnal range between day and night, uh, relatively uh, scarce rainfall, mainly in spring. Uh, winters are cold with frost and fog. Uh, altitude here is 200 to 400 meters. And the main uh, varieties are uh, in this sort of cooler climate are unsurprisingly Chardonnay, uh, Pinot Noir, uh, but also uh, Charolo. Uh, so those uh, are, are the sub-regions of the huge um, Comtat de Barcelona region. It takes a little bit longer to do that one for obvious reasons, being 95% of the production. Now it's on to uh, the next of Carver's regions. Uh, back to you, Catherine. Yeah, so we're going to move away and we're going to explore the most northerly area of the Diocaba, which is the valley around the Ebro, which is the longest river in Spain. The key thing to know about this region is that it's kind of shaped like a luge with the Pyrenees Mountains to the north and the Sistema Iberico Range to the south. The Ebro River just tunnels right through the middle. So while the climate is continental, the vineyards are influenced by these powerful, cold, dry winds called the Cierzo winds. Um, those come off the Bay of Biscay to the northwest and they're channeled east through the valley to the low pressure system off the Mediterranean. The Ebro Valley has been divided into two production subzones, Alto Ebro and Valle del Cierzo. The Alto Ebro to the west centers around the town of Logroño. Uh, we're more or less on the border here between Rioja and Nevada. Uh, with a mild climate and moderate rainfall thanks to these mountain ranges, we're at an altitude of around 600 meters, that's about 200 feet in American. The main grapes are Macabeo, Garnacha, and Chardonnay. The second subzone, the Valle del Cierzo, is in the central area of the Ebro River Valley uh, around Aragon, or in Aragon. <laughs> We're just south of the Pyrenees here. The climate is continental with cold winters and hot summers. And again, that Cierzo wind makes for bright acidity in the Macabeo and Garanacha grapes. Thanks, Catherine. Well, when I uh, mentioned the, the disparate nature of the Carva Dio and how relatively unusual that is, uh, here's case in point. Inyedos de Almendrajelejo is the furthest southwest. Uh, it's very uh, flat here relative to the regions further north. Uh, it's also warmer, unsurprisingly. Uh, the vineyards enjoy a dry climate, mild winters, high temperatures in summer, accentuated by the action of the warm wind known locally as the uh, Silano. Um, I, I'm thinking a kind of benign mistral. Um, the maximum altitude is 450 meters. Uh, the main grapes are Macabau, uh, uh, Paralada, and Suberat Parent, uh, also known as uh, Alarije, uh, an indigenous white variety once thought to be part of the Malvasia family. Uh, more again on varieties uh, next time, but in the meantime, uh, our final region, Catherine. Yeah, the fourth defined region is currently known as Levante. It's about a 30 minute drive inland from the Mediterranean Sea, just west of the city of Valencia. Um, now that term Levante is temporary, but just to explain it, it basically means east. It translates as rising in Spanish and it's used to describe the sun rising in the east. Uh, anyway, the Spanish Levante is noted for having pretty extreme weather. It's hot and dry in the summer with temperatures reaching 104 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 40 degrees Celsius and quite cold in the winter with temperatures dropping down to 14 degrees Fahrenheit, that's negative 10 Celsius. Now, if you know the wines of the Alicante and Jumilla Appalachians down around there, you're probably picturing these craggy old head-trained vines that produce super concentrated reds like Mon made from Monastrell, um, thanks to that hot summer sun. But in this, in this Appalachian, we're really around that town of Requena, you can see on that map there. There are highlands there with the elevations of about 2,000 to 3,000 feet, that's about 600 to 900 meters, where Macabeo, Garnacha, and Chardonnay can be grown. Um, this region gets maritime winds off the Mediterranean from the east, specifically the Solano wind, which David mentioned. 
Um, and at this elevation, winemakers actually have to enhance the color of their red still wines. Uh, they have a technique there called doble pasta. So it actually is a great place to produce sparkling wine. Um, and that concludes our map of the newly defined regions. So what impact do these regions have on the wines? Well, let's find out. Uh, so to the first of our guests and uh, also a cava that I, I, I really enjoy as, as well. Uh, let's talk to uh, Marta Casas uh, from Paris Balta. Um, Marta, uh, thank you very much uh, indeed for joining us uh, for this webinar. Thank you for inviting me and uh, a brilliant explanation of all of these subzones and zones that uh, a good step and essential step that uh, we needed uh, this years ago for this appellation that uh, gives to you uh, this is splendid and uh, but these bubbles that are uh, fantastic so cheers and i have oh. here my glass <laughs> to congratulate you <laughs> i can't wait to open this so um with apologies to those who don't have it but um, no um uh, really a pleasure to talk to you um, and let's talk about organic and biodynamic farming because people are going to mm -hmm. be really fascinated. Um, in your opinion, how does organic and biodynamic farming affect the quality of the cava? Biodynamic means uh, the treatment that we take care to the soil, to the plant, with another plant to heal our vines, our vineyards. So here you can see these horns with this uh, manure that uh, is transformed in a compost. So we diluted this in water, we din dynamized it, it uh, as an homeopathic treatment. So here with biodynamic, we uh, need to give life to the soil, life to the vine, and then life to the wine. So here with uh, these wines that you have with biodynamic way, you have uh, different uh, texture, different uh, final uh, uh, composition of your wine because it's free from herbicides, from pesticides. So all is uh, organic way and with these plants that help your plants. So here we achieve these uh, special and outstanding wines. Well, tell us, uh, as I'm going to open it now, but tell us about your um, micro cuvee uh, series, which by the way, I just think looks so beautiful. Uh, the, the, the design is just beautiful. It's of course what's inside that matters, but I have to say that. So, so tell us about these wines. Th these wines are uh, our top range <coughs> wines that uh, we label with this simple uh, style that we want to express um, the quality and uh, the soul of these wines when you taste it in, in the glass. So with this micro cubes, uh, we choose different plots, single plots for making these uh, um, unique wines. In this case, with this cava, we have these um, plots in the upper part of uh, the valley. Here you can see in, uh, in the map, uh, the vineyards in, in these two um, rivers. So we have the vineyards in the upper part of the Valley Anoya Foch. And um, here we have Charello, we have the Chardonnay and Pinot Noir for making these uh, single plots and these uh, blendings. And then with the other wines that are in this micro cuvee, we mean that's a uh, little production of these wines that we make mm, by hand, all, all is picked by hand. Then uh, is uh, fermented, uh, some wines that are red or wine, uh, white, sorry, are made in, uh, in, in barrels uh, with the pijage by hand. So all of these micro series, micro range wines are uh, special wines, handmade, with uh, this characteristic that are single plots and uh, uh, short productions. So here you have this cava of um, Charello mainly that uh, is grown in the central part and we have some uh, plots in, in the mountains and Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, all both are totally in the north part. So we have the vineyards upper part in the mountain. Uh, it's around 700 uh, meters of altitude. So there with uh, this uh, location, this uh, maritime uh, winds and this temperature that is uh, uh, perfect for the ripening, 
in the mountain we achieve these aromas and this texture. We are very proud of these vineyards there. Well, I'm not surprised. There's a beautiful uh, purity uh, to the, the fruit and, and it's, it's so harmonious. Um, on the subject of harmonious, um, you, you and your sister-in-law um, yes. are co-winemakers, uh, Maria Elena. Um, yes. What is it like working with, collaborating with a, a, a family member? You know, uh, working with family and here in Penedes and in Cabo region, we are a lot, a lot of uh, families uh, involved in, uh, in wineries. It's, it's difficult, but it's uh, a, good, uh, a good work uh, for joining force, for uh, pushing up a lot of things. And here with uh, uh, our co-working, it was a destiny. It was the love as well, because we weren't from the family. We are the wives from the, the sons of the family. So uh, it was the passion that we had with the wine because I was a pharmacist. My sister-in-law was a chemical engineer. So another to, to have involved in, in, in our origin. But now with uh, this uh, near 20 years ago, we, we are uh, joined us. Um, we had a lot of uh, work a lot of uh, we are very proud of the 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 first work of uh, our grandfather the grandfather from Giuseppe and Juan my my bro, uh, my brother in law and my my husband and uh, we are like a table that has uh, these four legs so without one the table is not stable so here we are four uh, different characters, different uh, patients, uh, and uh, with all of this, we have this balance to have the decisions, to have the, the mind open, to, to make these different wines, and to have this vision that the grandfather had uh, in the past, that he wanted to have in the glass the wine as natural as we can. So here with the biodynamic and uh, first of all with organic way that he worked, uh, we achieve this and uh, it's a team, it's a team and uh, always uh, with discussions, of course, but uh, with, oh, sorry, uh, with uh, this um, energy that we put together all, all of our, uh, we are for, so two couples. <laughs> Good answer. Um, you're uh, talking of your, your grandfather, the estate goes back way further to uh, uh, 1790, I, I think. Yes. How old are your oldest vines? This date is the first uh, papers that we have uh, dated uh, of the vineyards in the old past. And um, the, the vineyards that we have now, the, the oldest is around uh, 100 years old because the grandfather said, this vineyard is like me. It uh, was planted when I was born. So uh, here we have this uh, vineyard that's uh, in bush pine, uh, and it is a chorello, and uh, it's for a still wine. It's called Electio, and it's barrel fermented. And then we have uh, more vineyards that are around 40, 50 years old. And of course, we have young vineyards because we were planting uh, different, uh, different moments. And now we are just... Um, having new plantations of these ancestral varieties that uh, are Malvasia, Desiges, Sumol, Forcada, Moneo, are uh, most of them for still wines, but of course for having this uh, vision that uh, we, we want to achieve more different, different characters of these wines. And of course with Charello, we are planting more, more vineyards and uh, with Grenache, Grenache uh, Noir for making the Rosé Cava that we have one Cava that's with uh, Rosé Grenache. We're already getting questions that I knew we would and, and uh, interesting questions about um, uh, biodynamic um, agriculture, which is always so fascinating. So um, Andrew uh, says, um, uh, Marta, uh, does it concern you that biodynamic farming has no scientific support. Um, he mentions a group of Italian winemakers uh, describing it as, as witchcraft, which um, <laughs> I guess you're probably familiar with people using those sorts of terms. It's, it's true and not, because uh, you have, um, it, it is a philosophy, a way of life, of course, 
And I understood this and I was passionate with this because uh, it has three steps, no, four, four steps. One is the observation, observation of your um, vineyards, your family and you as well. Then is thinking of this, thinking of this observation of uh, your plants, your life, your way of um, working. Then is feeling this. So this is observation, thinking, feeling, and uh, after all the, of this, action, the action of uh, doing this biodynamic way. So if you don't do these um, steps, it's difficult to understand biodynamics. So when I teach this, because I'm a teacher of uh, biodynamics here in the region and in Spain as well, uh, explain to the students that uh, it's a thing that they need to learn, they need to, to have open-minded. And then if they feel it, uh, it's the moment to do it. If they don't feel this, it's, uh, it's better to do the same things that they are done by this moment. Because uh, if not, you have uh, a sensation that's uh, a thing that's this, uh, that's a mystic or a philosophy and this kind of things. So it's important to believe it. it and uh, with the previous studying and uh, uh, visiting wineries that are making by the next. So I invite uh, everyone that wants to learn more about biodynamics to come here, to taste the wines, to visit the vineyards, to explain this. And then if you want to have the, um, the result of this vitality that we obtain with these uh, treatments, we can do uh, an, an analy analysis of um, crystallizations of these forces that are in um, special analyze that we can do. So it's now uh, very complicated to explain, but I invite uh, all of the, the, the guests, of all of uh, the viewers that are here to come to the winery to taste and to learn about biodynamics. Well, there's uh, a lot of love for uh, the, the cava, that's for sure. Looking at the, the chat function, you know, uh, Peter Ranscombe, hello, Peter. Uh, loving the rich hue in the glass, Brad Horn. Wonderful, pure uh, focus to the fruit and the, the balance, the weight, texture, acidity. Loving these wines and their philosophies. Uh, it, it, uh, the list goes on. So thank you for uh, the comments in the chat function and also um, the Q&A. Uh, Catherine, are there any other questions that you want to uh, pick up on uh, for Marta? Um, well, you know, I was sort of interested by this question that Samantha Cole Johnson placed in the uh, in the chat. Could you explain the unique flavor of Penedes versus the other newer cop or new cava areas? Um, are the wines riper, leaner? What's the difference between the, these different geographical regions in terms of the, the aromatics and flavors of the wines? Here in this valley that uh, you explained very well with these two rivers, with the Montserrat Mountains, then Matizol Garraf in the south, that's uh, Little Hills, and uh, Serra d'Ancosa in the another part of the north. Uh, you can achieve uh, special flavors, special uh, ripening. And uh, with these uh, chorelos that are in altitude and then in the other part, part of that's flat, but uh, it's very, very interesting, this uh, structure, this um, sensation of uh, fattiness in, in the mouth. When you have this Cava de Guarda, that's a uh, lot of uh, months aging. Here we have uh, the vintage uh, 2012. So it was bottled uh, in the 13. So eight years ago, the, the lease inside the, the bottle. So here you can achieve a special wine to have this long aging. It's very interesting, this area for making this Cava de Guarda Superior and Paraje. That's uh, here we have a, a kind of um, Parajes Calificados that are very, very outstanding wines. So I invite, uh, I don't know the name of the guest that, uh, and, um, have the, the question, but uh, so I invite uh, him or her to, to come to Barcelona, to Penedes, to Cava, to taste these uh, unique wines, to understand more, better. <laughs> 
Well, thank you, Marta. I think, I'd, you know, on that note, I'd love to move on to Mark, Mark Klapes. And um, Mark, we're very lucky to have you because you're also a certified sommelier. Um, so maybe you can also speak a little bit more about aromatics and flavors of the different regions. But maybe you can start us off by telling us where your vineyards are located. Oh, Mark, you're, you're muted. Mark. Yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, David. Uh, well, we are located uh, just six kilometers from Villafranca del Penedès. So we are in the heart of the Penedès. And we are in an altitude around 300 meters. And that uh, would be uh, an area especially good for the, for the Charello grape. You know, Charello doesn't like uh, to be well. Marta would explain much better than me about this because I'm not a winemaker, but Charello likes, uh, doesn't like uh, too much uh, cold or fog. So we're in a very great area for, for Charello. However, we are not in the best area for Parallada because as David says, said before, Parallada tends to grow better in higher altitudes. So generally, we use little parallada, okay? And going back to Charello, I think uh, is the true jewel of, of our area, of Penedès especially. You can do still wines, young with oak, uh, with some batonage, and the same with cavas. It gives you the potential for very long aging to do first a par a partial fermentation in oak, so super versatile grape and the true jewel, I think, of, of Penedès. Sorry, I was muted as well. Um, so I'm curious about, you know, I think we're going to taste two different wines from you today, and they're, they're a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. I think the, those of us who have the wine in the UK are tasting the Black Label Treasure Gold. Sounds very intriguing. Um, <laughs> Maybe tell us a little bit about your export markets. What's it like exporting cava to the UK and the US? What challenges do you face? Well, to the UK, we just started actually. And the first shipment is coming just now as we speak. And it will be more online in Amazon UK and as well in the website of our, of our portal, Vessel Wines. And in the US, we have exported cava for many, many, many years. So it's one of the, our best markets, the US. Um, and here in the US, those of us who have uh, the wine, it's the Paul Cheneau. So now that's a different label. It's a French name. And there's yes. kind of an interesting story as to why you have this French name on your label. Can you tell us that story? Yes, it's a little story. So in our origins, we were at a distillery producing brandy out of our vineyards, a two distillation brandy. It was so good. One of our most important clients was a very famous French group called Rémy Martin in France. So the two families had this long relationship for many years. And in the late 80s, brandy sales were kind of going down and Cava was becoming more and more popular. So the two families decided to create a joint venture and convert our old distillery into a modern Cava house and taking advantage of the know-how that uh, Remy Martin had in the Champagne area. Because at that time they had three Champagne houses, Charles Heitzig, Piper Heitzig and Krug. So that's how we started. So it was a Spanish Cava with a much French influence. And then when creating a brand together, we thought, okay, this is Spanish wine, you know, from, from Penedes, from the Cava area. So we will name it with a French name that at that time, and they thought it was more appealing for a sparkling wine. So that's a bit the story. So this is basically the Krug of Spain is what you're saying. Okay, you, you've got me <laughs> convinced. You've got me convinced. Um, so as someone who's exporting these wines, I'm just curious, maybe you can tell us what we've got wrong about cava. What are some common misconceptions that uh, customers in the UK and the US have about cava? Well, in terms of consumers, because the trade normally knows, knows their business, but I think in terms of consu final consumers, uh, sometimes I, I think people don't know 
the method, the, the, the classical traditional method that cows are made. So we produce sparkling wines the same way as Champagne or Cremando or in California and other areas in the world. Uh, but, and we often compete with Prosecco, which is a different method, more basic. I don't say it's bad, but it's a more basic method. There is not so much aging involved and Cavas uh, are not placed in the, where they deserve to be. That's where I think that, no? It has to be cheap and cheerful and the sort of, of speech that I think Kava is much more than that. That's so true. Um, and we actually have some um, interesting questions here in the Q&A. Um, Samantha Cole Johnson is asking, do you see more importers and retailers willing to carry these higher end, higher quality Kavas? Since as you mentioned, the, the, the consumers are kind of used to they're expecting a cava that's a little more affordable. So is it difficult to sell these higher end? I think it's difficult. I think it is difficult, yes. But I think also that the, these recent movements of the Cava Regulatory Council, uh, doing the Cava de Guarda, Guarda Superior, more aging, all organic. So all these moves should help us elevate the category of Cava and, and better communicate what a wonderful uh, sparkling wine is. And actually, I believe that the true value in Cava are the Cava de Guarda Superior. So what we refer as Reserva and Gran Reserva. That is where you find unbelievable wines at a very competitive price. I don't think good value has to be the entry level Cavas. That's so true, that's so true. Well, I wanna tap into your sommelier experience, Mark, um, and maybe can you tell us a little bit about what's special about Cava, maybe about the aromatics and the flavors for those of us who are maybe more familiar with other sparkling ones, what are the aromatics and flavors we should be looking for in Cava? And well, what, what are some of your favorite Cava food pairings too? Yeah, well, I would say in Cava we have lots of minerality, lots of fruit. It's very clean with a great, great acidity. And it's actually a fantastic wine for food. I would, I would, I think the greatest maybe characteristic of cava is its immense versatility. You know, you can drink cava in its own as an aperitif or through a whole meal. You know, there are so many types of cavas more age, less age, with more dosage, with no dosage. So there is really a cava for every moment. As a, so if you go to a, a restaurant and you ask a sommelier, I want to have a meal uh, of three dishes or more, and, but I only want to have one wine. Generally, the sommelier will, will, recommend, uh, will recommend bubbles, you know, and cava is, is such, so good for this. Okay, how about a really surprising pairing? I feel like I've seen in Spain people having cava with ham. Have I seen that? With Iberico ham? Yeah. Oh, that is one of my favorite uh, pairings. Yeah, because Iberico ham uh, can be kind of salty. And so usually you have a, a geographic pairing, a natural pairing, which would be vinos de Jerez, uh, cherry wines, especially fino manzanilla. Those are as well kind of salty wines, so they make a perfect harmony. But with Cava Brun Nature, and especially a Grand Reserva Brun Nature Cava, you also have this synergy spectacular. You know, all the minerality of a long age Cava with no dosage and the jamón is just fantastic. Mm. Um, well, so uh, one more question for you from David Way. Um, on the black label cava, he's asking how many months does that uh, stay on the lees? It stays between 12 and 15 months. Yeah, so as you know, minimum aging for cava is nine months, but when we do a cava de guarda, so a younger cava, we age at least 12 months, just that you get a little bit of the autolytic activity, so you will get a bit more complexity. Of course, it will be a uh, sparkling wine of a young style, but with nine months, you don't achieve this little more substance that you, you, you get if you age it a few, month, uh, a few months more in the bottle. Wonderful, well, thank you. I'm gonna hand it over now to David to speak with Angel Hernandez. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And uh, Mark, um, I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the Black Label too. And there's uh, plenty of love for that too coming in the chat function. Uh, Brad Horn saying, a wonderful mineral note, ripe fruit, nice weight and length. I can, I can really imagine the, your, your ham on, you know, that, that, so those salt, uh, that saltiness, those salt crystals really uh, working with this. But uh, thank you for now, uh, Mark. And uh, yeah, as, uh, as you said, Catherine, uh, it's time uh, to move on to Angel Hernandez uh, from Bodegas uh, Faustino. Um, Angel, um, thank you very much indeed um, for joining us and for waiting patiently there. <laughs> thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Catherine. I mean, it's been a real pleasure being here today. Thank you. Well, thank you. Your bodegas located in the Ebro Valley, uh, right on the border uh, between Rioja and the Basque country. Um, tell us a bit about uh, that location. Yeah, we, we are uh, located in the what is called the Rioja wine region, which is also dominated the Alto Ebro. And uh, this is a very different uh, location, I think, from our friends from uh, the Mediterranean area. Uh, I think the, the main characteristic, as you mentioned in the, in the introduction, is that we are basically at higher altitude. We are normally around 650, uh, 500 meters. And also, of course, the climatology is very different. I mean, it's totally uh, continental, almost totally continental. We got some uh, influence from the Mediterranean uh, through the Ever River. Uh, but it's a very humid place. We, we got a lot of rains uh, and uh, it's very hot in, uh, in summer, but it can be really, really cold in winter. So tell us a bit more about um, your aspect, um, elevation. Um, are these uh, sparkling wine grapes produced at higher elevations than the, the still wine uh, vineyards that we, uh, from the wines that we'll be very familiar with, with a name like Faustino? Well, uh, not really. I mean, actually we have uh, our uh, 20 hectares that we have uh, for Cava. We have the, the divided in different three zones. And uh, the, the highest altitude we have, it's uh, around 670 meters, if I'm not mistaken. And, and while the lowest would be somewhere around 470 meters. But uh, it is quite a similar, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, distribution that we have for the uh, steel wines. The brand name is uh, so uh, famous uh, for um, Rioja wines, reds, whites, uh, and rosés too, of course. Um, so I'm going to crack open uh, my bottle, um, and this is the first time I will have, have tasted this actually. But um, fantastic! <laughs> uh, wh why why make a cava as well with the Faustino name? Well, well everything comes uh, actually from the early '80s. You know, uh, at those times, Don Julio, the third generation of the family, was in charge of the of, of the winery, and he's been by far the, the pioneer of the of, of the group. I mean, uh, he, he he started, he took over with one winery, and when he uh, left the company, uh, let's say uh, uh, when he retired, he ended up we ended up having seven wineries in uh, seven appellations. So early in the 80s, I mean, uh, he was one of the first to plant Chavonets, for example, in the Rioja. Uh, it was not a, a very common, let's say, uh, uh, variety. And um, uh, from in those days, he just said, okay, we have uh, fantastic wines, we have a sun, a fantastic uh, chocolate grapes, we have fantastic Buda, which is uh, the Macabeo, of course. And uh, he said, why not? Let's try, let's uh, experiment, and let's see what we can uh, get. And I, uh, the first uh, run, it was 4,000 bottles only. And he was so happy about it that he said, I mean, we're going to rock it. So he, he decided to go for it. So which year was this? When, when was the first production of a Carvo? That was 1982. Okay. And how big is it for you now as a part of your portfolio at uh, Fastino? Well, it, it, is a, it is a very nice to have. Uh, a, a range extension for us is important. It is very important. I mean, we, 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 have, we, we take very good care of our Cava and we are very proud of representing, you know, uh, worldwide. Um, let's say, but in, in the, compared to the steel wine, it's a steel, uh, it is a small part of it. Uh, Faustino was, uh, I believe, uh, the first Rioja winery to uh, achieve organic certification uh, in its vineyards. Um, 
We learned in the previous seminar um, that uh, Pinedes is, is moving towards 100% organic certification. Um, is this something you can see happening in Rioja as well one day? That's a fantastic question. I mean, uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion about organic, obviously, everywhere. Uh, but I have to say no. Uh, I mean, uh, they, this, and, and I'm going to tell you why exactly. I mean, this climatology, it's very, very, very... Uh, I mean, you can get very strong diseases easily, you know, on the plants. And uh, you have a lot of humidity, you can get fungus, you can get... So uh, I don't see our 750 hectares going through or to, to organic, I mean, um, in the short term or even in the mid term. Maybe in the future when we are, as we obviously, we are progressing, we are trying to be uh, go uh, further through the, through the organic line, but I don't see that happening on the steel wines in the, not even in the mid term, to be honest. And uh, really enjoying uh, your cover. As I said, I haven't uh, tasted it before. Um, so um, if we haven't seen the, the technical sheet yet, um, which I think we probably have, but we can um, definitely see it again. But there are already some quite interesting um, questions coming in. Going to come to that in a second. But I just wondered um, how important it is uh, if you've got a very recognizable name like Faustino, do you find that that uh, brand um, can be a ladder, can carry people into products like Carva that they maybe haven't tried before? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, no doubt about it. I mean, our strength in distribution, for example, it's key uh, for us to, to, to reach some uh, markets or to reach some, uh, uh, let's say, channels that otherwise it would be very, very hard for us to, 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 to do it. So definitely, I mean, I think our brand name is, is, is something really positive. And uh, from the questions that are coming in, uh, so Andrew again, uh, this uh, he, he's uh, addressed towards uh, either you or Mark, but let, let's take it for you, Angel. Um, uh, do you worry that the um, integrity of the Carver category is diluted in any way by using international grape varieties like Chardonnay uh, versus the ones that we tend to associate with Carver? Uh, to be honest with you, not at all. I mean, this is something we do also in our uh, steel white wines. And no, I mean, it's, it's great can grow uh, uh, with different typicity uh, in a different climatology, in a different, we have a different uh, treatment with a different soil. Absolutely not. I mean, Chardonnay is planted practically everywhere in the world, uh, everywhere. I mean, like it's one of the most planted uh, uh, grapes. And in, I think the beauty of it is in each region, you can find a different uh, uh, concept, a different, uh, let's say, hint. Uh, and I think it's totally positive. I, I, I think diversity is good. But that's my opinion. And some uh, looking across the, the chat function now as well, um, uh, agreement with you, Angel, uh, and the USA distribution channels are key and uh, brands um, trusted. And um, the, the, that distribution factor, there must be you know, so many occasions where I taste a really great wine, but it's not available in a shop. You know, it's very hard to recommend something like that. So are you able, uh, through having a big group like Faustino behind you, uh, to use a, a degree of leverage to get products onto shelves? Oh, yeah. I mean, definitely. As I mentioned before, I mean, uh, our, one of our strengths of our groups is, uh, I mean, we've been exporting for probably 90 years already, and, and, and we were one of the very first to, to, to do it in, in Rioja. So we have a very strong distribution worldwide. We are present in more than 140 countries, and uh, definitely that, that's, that's an advantage. I mean, when you go there, you are, you are negotiating with somebody, you are trying to propose a category uh, a review uh, to, to anybody. I mean, you, you, you can put your cover inside. Absolutely. It's, a, it's a very nice to have extra, I would say. Well, it's very nice to have this and to be introduced to this as well, to be honest. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes to go. Um, Catherine, if I um, bring you uh, back in, um, and I think we should, at uh, this point, we'll bring uh, Marta uh, and Mark back in as well, so that it's uh, you know, a, a general kind of free-for-all uh, with some of the questions and uh, the comments that we're seeing in the chat function too. Um, Catherine, uh, while um, we've been talking, is there anything that uh, you've uh, seen that you want to pick up in terms of questions? 
Yeah, I actually, I wanted to get back up to the beginning of the Q&A. There are quite a few questions about organic agriculture. So perhaps Marta or Angel can answer. Um, this was an interesting one. Are you concerned that by requiring organic agriculture uh, in, in those reserva level, those higher level um, cavas, will the sort of required organic agriculture, will that kind of force producers to possibly use too much copper in their vineyards? And, and might this lead to some copper pollution? Is there any concern about that? Uh, if I, if you want, uh, I can answer this. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a good thing, not a concerning thing. Um, because um, being organic, being uh, with uh, this uh, biodiversity that, that we achieve with this way of uh, viticulture, we uh, grow in, in, in other plants, we grow in uh, sustainability, we grow in different ways. Of course, uh, the use of uh, copper that uh, I, I understood copper, yes, uh, is, is the, the basic uh, uh, substain of uh, antifungal treatment. But uh, we have a lot of years ago using um, an infusions of uh, horsetail. So is a plant that uh, has silica, has uh, this uh, mineral that uh, dries the leaves, dries, dries uh, the fungus, and we achieve good results. So it's a future, it's a, a good future for this, uh, this, minu, this minu, uh, having less uh, quantities of copper. So it's a good future. I like that answer. That's a very natural solution to a, a problem, um, a natural biodynamic solution. Um, another question that's very interesting, I'm thinking about Francia Corta, which recently had to kind of introduce a new grape variety that would work better with climate change, with the warmer temperatures they're having in that region. Uh, this question from Chris Goldman, uh, given the impact of climate change, is there likely to be any variation in the list of approved grape varieties? Is anyone kind of facing some challenges with the grape varieties that you're allowed to use? Um, Angel, if you want, or uh, Mark? Not from our side, at least. I mean, uh, we, we, as we mentioned, we, we, we have Maccabeo and Chardonnay, and uh, so far so good. I mean, we, we are not facing any, any, any challenges in that sense. For, for the varieties for, uh, with cava, we don't have problems. With uh, varieties for still wines, we are doing different things with uh, varieties that have a long cycle, vegetative cycle. So uh, the harvest is later and uh, maintaining the, the balance with sugar and uh, acidity. So it's a good solution. We have this with um, uh, Cariñena Blanca, that's uh, from typical from uh, the north in Catalonia, in Empordà. So here we have a, a little plot that we are doing these um, three vintages uh, ago, uh, that it's a good result. And uh, with Forcada and Moneu, we have uh, different studies uh, that are in the research center here in Bodegas Torres that they are studying that uh, for these uh, varieties that have the, the same, the, this long cycle, vegetative cycle, uh, they achieve uh, fresh wines with low alcohol degree and with a lot of aroma. So this is uh, coming another time, a new solution for this uh, climate change. And we will see the future uh, if we need to plant uh, all in the upper part or not, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Something that every wine region is having to face, of course. Um, a question from Samantha Cole Johnson. I'm going to throw it out to all three of you. Are there any predictions for the addition of more Cavas de Paraje Calificado? These are the kind of the Grand Cru vineyard sites. There are only a few. The list is fairly short right now. Um, is there a discussion of adding more sites to this list? Um, Angel, do you want to grab that? I don't have a reply to that, honestly. I mean, I haven't heard anything about that. Sorry for that. Perhaps Mark? Yeah, yeah let's hear from the Samoye. There he is. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't heard anything about it, so I don't know what to, what to say. 
I mean, it's all fairly new. Every all these changes are happening very quickly. So it's kind of one of those areas. It's very exciting to just keep watching. And I think every every month there'll be a, a new announcement coming out from the Cava Dio. There's just so much going on. One thing I wanted to point out is I can't think of another nationwide appellation because um, you know the theme today is geography and. Isn't it, I, I just love the fact that you all are collaborating. You're not all from the same geographic region. You know, in other in other nations, sometimes you see um, a lot of competition between d different wine growing regions, and there's not a lot of communication. And the fact that you all are are on the same panel, you're all having discussions, you're collaborating, you're sharing. I think it's just kind of a, a beautiful thing. Um, have you had much chance to speak with uh, wine growers in in the south of Spain? I don't know if it's uh, this intensity of com communication, but uh, it's uh, the new trend, the new things that uh, are the wine growers that are uh, beginning and perhaps some of them are little than others that are bigger. Here in Penedes area, we are joining little by little more. I don't know uh, the relationship uh, with the South or with uh, Rioja or uh, Valencia, it's better with the council or here uh, with the, the people, young people that we are involved in the vineyards and this new movement with uh, organic way, with new trends of uh, new styles of wine, uh, new things that are moving. And here with these new rules that we have uh, with this zonification in Cava, it's a good chance to have this movement in the Cava region that we need. We need this and uh, we are very uh, happy. We are very proud of this new regulation, this new, uh, whoops, sorry, <laughs> I, I got this atrezzo. Uh, <laughs> and uh, well, it's uh, good things that the, the, all is moving and all is changing. So we are very happy to, with this. Yeah, from my side, I think it's part of the beauty of, uh, of, of, the, of the Cava. I mean, um, Absolutely. I mean, you can find different type of covers depending on the region, and I think that's beautiful. I mean, it's, it's, it can only be positive. I agree. It is great to see. And um, another thing that it is very encouraging to see is um, uh, you know, the emphasis on um, you know, premium um, carver. Um, one of the questions earlier on, are you seeing, perhaps this is uh, one for you, Mark, now, and then Angel, um, are you seeing people um, prepared to pay more in export markets for fine quality carver? Well, if you allow me, Angel, uh, I think they wouldn't do a mistake if they spend a bit more. Because as I said before, I truly believe that is with Cavas de Guarda Superior, so the Reserva and Gran Reserva Cavas, where we really find extraordinary value for money wines. Uh, I think entry level champagnes, to say champagne, the most prestigious sparkling wine in the world, uh, entry level champagnes, they are not cheap. And I think a Gran Reserva or Reserva Cava can easily beat the quality and it is still probably more affordable so i would say try try and, and you will be surprised of the the variety of styles and and the good quality of the wines how great they are with food so you cannot go wrong yeah. from my point of view i think it's uh, uh answering your question david i mean yes i mean there is there is there is uh, there are channels that and, and that where are consumers that are uh, connoisseurs that are ready to to uh, to pay for the premium? Obviously, there is uh, a lot to do from uh, the Cava Dio, uh, but it's a lot. To, there's a lot to do from the producers. Uh, I'm talking about communication. I'm talking about, uh, as Mark said, working on the very premium. Um, most of the cases, I mean, the people you have the amateurs trying the, your Cavas on our Cavas, when, and, and they say, oh, "Wow, I mean, this is amazing." I mean, they, because Probably they have tried the very entry level of the super, super, super commercial ones. And uh, so, yes, I mean, I think there's a lot to do. I think the, the, the movement that the DO is doing is fantastic in the world that direction. But uh, yeah, I think we are right on, on the, on the two way. And Marta, do you have a, a thought about uh, price as well? 
It's um, the, the the typical question that uh, you have, but uh, we need to put our wines in a high level of um, uh, value. If not, we are lost. So here it's a typical fight with the price, with uh, all, we have a high quality here in Penedes, in a long uh, of uh, all of the wineries here, there are different, different sizes, of course, different styles, but all, most of them are very high quality. So we must to, um, to put uh, the value with this. So uh, we need to, to have uh, these uh, prices that are the quality that we have. So we must to, to put in, in this panel. <laughs> yeah, well, here, here. And there's um, a lot of people are agreeing with that in the, in the chat function too, just around um, the value. Uh, you know, of course, value is about uh, more than just price. Value is about what you actually get uh, for your money, which is sometimes uh, what people uh, forget, I think. So uh, fantastic uh, to uh, be able to cover that as well. Thank you everyone for the, uh, the comments and the questions. Uh, Catherine, uh, unless there's anything else that you want to uh, bring in, then I think um, that uh, concludes um, our, our session today. The, the hour is uh, now up. Yeah, I think we've used our hour very well. We've all learned a lot. It's been a real pleasure hearing from Mark and Angel and Marta. And uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks for attending. And and uh, this was really an enjoyable hour. Yeah. Thank, right, you thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you to our hosts and our panelists. And a big thanks to all of you, our attendees, for tuning in today. Uh, just a reminder, the series will continue, uh, but now the USA and U UK markets will go different tracks. Uh, so the next uh, webinars to be held is, are about grape varieties. So that for the US, that will be September 22nd uh, with Martin Reyes and W. And then in the UK with Susie Atkins on September 29th. And then following that, the Trading Up Sustainably, uh, which for the UK will be November 10th with Richard Bamfield. And for the US, uh, Martine returns on November 17th to cover that topic. Um, so uh, once again, um, also uh, as a reminder, a link to the video recording of today's webinar will be sent out in a follow-up email. And we look forward to seeing you shortly. Also, just another uh, reminder, too, about the Kava Academy, which is an e-learning platform uh, open to wine professionals from all over the world. Uh, Susanna just uh, dropped a link into the chat. So please click that uh, to find out more. Uh, registrations are being accepted through August 26th. So thank you once again, and everyone have a great rest of your week.